Massachusetts Representative Thomas Tip O'Neill, Jr., Speaker of the House of Representatives. O'Neill will deliver the 69th lecture in the Landon Lecture Series here at Kansas State University. The speaker held a news conference a short while ago, predicted that the initial vote tomorrow on President Reagan's plan for giving aid to the Contras of Nicaragua will fail. There will be two other votes following that. One will be on a Democratic plan, and the last and final will be on a moderate Republican plan. He didn't predict which one of those would pass. As you can hear from the applause, the speaker and the party have arrived on the stage. We switch now to the stage, and Kansas State University President Dr. Dwayne Auker. To the 69th Alfred M. Landon Lecture on Public Issues. We have with us this morning some special guests. They're in the front of the audience, and I would like to introduce them to you. First of all, the governor of Kansas, accompanied by his daughter, Lisa. Governor Carlin. And our congressman, Congressman Jim Slattery and his wife, Linda. Jim and Linda. And now I'll introduce to you members of the platform party. On your left, Mr. Edward Seaton, publisher of the Manhattan Mercury and the chair of the Landon Patrons, Mr. Seaton. <laughs> Dr. Charles Reagan, professor and head of our Department of Philosophy and chair of the series, Mr. Dr. Reagan. <laughs> On your Right, our new student body president, Mr. Steve Brown. Steve is a sophomore in veterinary medicine and is from Dodge City, Kansas, and was elected to this position just a bit more than a month ago. The chair of our faculty senate, professor of psychology, Dr. Jerry Freeman. Dr. Freeman. And today we are pleased to welcome to the Landon Lecture Series Massachusetts Representative Thomas Tip O'Neill, Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. And in 1936, the same year that he was graduated from Boston College, Speaker O'Neill was first elected to public office as a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives. He quickly assumed leadership responsibilities and in 1949 was elected the first Democratic speaker in the history of the Massachusetts House of Representatives. In 1952, he was elected to the United States Congress. He was appointed Majority Whip in the U.S. House of Representatives in 1971 and elected Majority Leader in 1973. In 1977, he was elected the 47th Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, and this past January was re-elected to serve for the fifth time by his colleagues, Speaker of the House. It is expected that the major political debates over budget and trade deficits this year will likely occur in the House of Representatives, where Democrats have a working majority and where Tip O'Neill presides. One week ago, Speaker O'Neill returned from Moscow where he had led a congressional delegation to meet with Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev to discuss issues such as arms control, human rights, and immigration. It is a pleasure and a privilege to introduce to you today a man of revered and distinguished service to this nation. Ladies and gentlemen, the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, Thomas Tip O'Neill. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Many years ago, I was appointed by Sam Rayburn, the Speaker of the House, to go to Wexford Island for the dedication of the statue of John Barry. Now, if you went to a parochial high school like I did, you know that John Barry is the father of the American Navy. If you went to a public school, you'll probably believe that John Paul Jones is the father of the American Navy. <laughs> we
We arrived in Cobe, went over in the America, my wife Millie and I was met by the State Department. I'd never been an island before in Cork City, the home of my forebears. State Department said, what would you like to do? I said, I'd like to see as much of the area of where my people came from. And we went up to the Blarney Stone and kissed the Blarney, Blarney Castle and kissed the Blarney Stone. And we saw the famous bells of Shandon and the beauty of the River Lee. And driving along, and the driver stopped the car, and he said, uh, that's our local hospital. I said, what's so unusual about that? Every community has a hospital. It's 1929, Henry Ford came to Cork City. It was the home of his mother and dad. He's at a local hotel about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and knock on the door, a group of men. They said, Mr. Ford, we're happy to welcome you here to Cork City, the home of your mother and dad. You, one of the world's great industrialists, one of the world's great manufacturers, one of the world's great philanthropists. We're building a hospital, and we thought perhaps in memory of mother and dad, you'd like to make a donation. <laughs> Ford sat down, wrote out a check, $5,000, and he gave it to them. The next day, the Cork Examiner came out with a blazing headline. It said, Henry Ford donates $50,000 to hospital. <laughs> that afternoon, a knock at the door, the same group of men, they came in and they said, Mr. Ford, we want to apologize for the mistake that the examiner made. Tomorrow they will make a correction. <laughs> Ford said, what does it cost to build a hospital? He said, $50,000. He said, give me my check back. <laughs> Took his check, tore it up, sat down, he wrote out a check for $50,000, and he held it up to those Irishmen, and he said, you may have this check for $50,000 on one condition. And those Irishmen didn't care about what the condition would be. He said, over the portals of this hospital, I want the inscription placed. And the inscription reads, I came among you, and you took me in. <laughs> so I want to thank you at Kansas State University for the fine welcome that I have received here today. It was a thing of beauty. I will tell one other story before I get into my remarks. Doctor, in 1952, when I was elected to the Congress of the United States, I was elected to take John F. Kennedy's place. He defeated Henry Cabot Lodge for the Senate, and I had been the local Speaker of the House, and I took his place in the Congress, the 8th Congressional District. Eight years later, it was January 19th. He had been elected President of the United States, January 19th, 1961. On January 20th, he's going to be inaugurated as President of the United States. I had my wife Millie and our five children. They range from 6 to 16. Down and we're at the Congressional Hotel. They're going to see a man inaugurated as President of the United States who had breakfast at their home, could have called every one of the children by their first name. Never again would be, be his family as close to this man who had the exalted office of President of the United States. Get up in the morning, and I took the children over, bundled them up in blankets in front of the, the Capitol so they'd be there for the inaugural. I went back for Millie, and Millie said, it's six above zero. We had had a terrific snowstorm the night before. Six above zero, I think I'll watch it on television. Well, as Jim Slattery can tell you, on the inaugural day, we, uh, we meet at about 11 o'clock and about 11.30 in a kind of a seniority fashion. With the chairman going first, we go out to the front of the stairs where the president is going to be inaugurated. No set seats. And uh, by the time I get over there, it was about three minutes to 12. And as I walked up to the, the door, there's a fellow there by the name of Frank McDermott. Frank had been an All-American quarterback at Fordham in 1936. I had played high school athletics against him. We hadn't seen each other in years. Tip O'Neill? I said, yeah, Frank McDermott. He said, what do you do, Tip? I said, I'm a member of Congress. What do you do, Frank? Frank says, I'm second in charge of Secret Service. He says, I'm running the festivities here today. He said, where are you sitting? I said, about 80 rows over there. He said, come on down and sit with the Kennedy family. Well, there were nine rows of the Kennedy family. <laughs> 
I get to the last row, and on the end seat, there's a fellow sitting there by the name of George Cara. We called him the ambassador. George came from Boston. Mystery man. Governor's being sworn in. He's sitting in the governor's box. Mayor of Boston is being sworn in. He's sitting on the city hall stage. Red Sox are playing. The Yankees are sitting among the wives. Always got the best seat at everything that came along. <laughs> we, as I said, we called him the ambassador. Mystery man. Man of affluence, had a beautiful home, big car. Nobody knew exactly what he did, but he was always at the right spot at the right time, and there he is sitting with the Kennedy family. So I said, uh, Ambassador, would you be kind enough to push over? And he looked at me and he says, quiet tip, he says, they'll kick us the heck out. <laughs> well, he pushed over and one minute later, John F. Kennedy, President of the United States, stood at my right shoulder, tall said, hat, so groomed so beautifully. I looked at him and I said, Mr. President, may God be with you. He said, thank you, Tip. Carol leaned over and he said, Mr. President, may God be with you. Well, well Kennedy was startled. He knew who Carol was. His chin hit his chest and just then they played hail to the chief. Kennedy walked down to take the oath of office. Cara tapped me on the shoulder and he said, historians will wonder what's in the young man's mind as he strode to take his oath of office, and he's wondering how Kara got the seat. <laughs> well, that night, Millie and I are at the Arsenal. We're at the ball, the Armory. Dancing around, Secret Service man came over and said, uh, Congressman, Mrs. O'Neill, the President and Jackie would like to say hello. So we danced over, and I said, Mr. President, your speech is going down on the annals of American history as one of the great speeches of all time. How proud it was a thing of beauty. He said, tip something on my mind. <laughs> I said, what is it, Mr. President? He said, was that Kara sitting beside you? <laughs> I said, not only was it Kara, but when they played hail to the chief and you walked down the aisle, Kara tapped me on the shoulder and he said, historians will wonder what's on the young man's mind as he strode to take his oath of office and he's wondering how Kara got the seat. The president looked at me and he said, tip, he said, I had my left hand on the Bible, my right hand in the air, the Chief Justice has give, given me the, code, the, the, the oath of office, and I'm saying to myself, how did Kara get that seat? <laughs> now, that's the story. 1,700 authors have written on Kennedy, and nobody has ever asked me for a story, and so that's a story that you've never read in a book. And that's the fellow whose place I took in the Congress. President Orca, Governor Carlin, my good friend Congressman Jim Slattery, members of the Board of Regents, faculties, students, and friends. I happen to be here because John Rhodes, who was the minority leader and the Republican leader of the House for eight years while I was either the majority leader or the speaker and a very close dear friend of mine as a graduate of Kansas State University, and he asked me at one time if I would do the lectures here. And then uh, Nancy, of course, called me afterwards, and so did Bob Dole. And with the insistence of Jim Slattery, I am more than delighted to be here today. Forty-nine years ago, the name of Governor Alf Landon appeared on the ballot as a Republican candidate for the presidency of the United States. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, there appeared on some of the same ballots the name of a young Democrat running for the state legislature, Tip O'Neill. It was my first successful campaign for public life. I had run for public office while a junior at Boston College and lost by a slim margin. I appreciate the opportunity to come out here today, the home state of Alf Landon, to honor the man who headed the other political team back in 1936. I'm glad to be here for another reason. As you know, President Reagan often invokes the words of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I think it's only fair that if a conservative Republican president can bring himself to honor a great liberal Democratic president, Franklin Roosevelt, then I'm happy to come out here and honor a Republican who ran against him and whom this lecture is named after. I'd like to take this opportunity to say something complimentary about our president. When President Reagan was first elected, 
I, like many others, made the mistake of underestimating his unique abilities. I remember the day I first met him. I was kidding him, and I said, Mr. President, welcome to the big leagues. After five years of dealing in close combat with the President, I can now attest to the fact that when it comes to communicating with the American people, when it comes to stating his philosophy clearly and plainly, when it comes to making the strongest possible case for what he believes in, Ronald Reagan, our president, is in a league by himself and an all-star, as a matter of fact, a Hall of Famer. In the few minutes that I have this morning, I want to offer you my own views of our country's history, my own philosophy of our American democracy and of our American government. I want to put today's headlines in perspective to review what our country has achieved in the past and what challenges it faces today and what role it can play tomorrow. First, I want to report to you two matters that have been very much in the headlines recently. My recent visit to Russia and tomorrow's vote on the Congress on Nicaragua. A week ago today, I returned from an important and dramatic visit to Moscow and Leningrad. Our delegation was bipartisan, for Michael, a Republican leader, was with us as a co-chairman. I carried with me a letter from the President of the United States to Mr. Gorbachev, the new General Secretary of the Communist Party. I have returned with a strong determination the relations between our countries be improved. It is clear to me that the new Soviet chairman is a tough, vigorous, shrewd, charism with a charisma, a Madison Avenue approach, a style that you have never seen in the communist and Russian leaders before. He proved to us in a meeting lasting almost four hours that he's a skilled advocate of, the government, of his government's positions and will be a tough negotiator. The key question for the United States is whether this change in leadership will lead to a change in relations between our two countries. Beginning with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, Soviet-American relations have declined steadily. We are experiencing what one historian has called a period of peril. In our relations, similar to the one that happened just after World War II. These periods of high tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union are a cause of enormous concern. Our two nations are nuclear superpowers. We have the capability of destroying not only each other, but all of civilization. For 40 years, we have been locked into an economic, ideological, technological, and strategic competition with the Soviet Union, a competition that has, span, has spanned every corner of the globe. The invasion of Afghanistan, the suppression of solidarity in Poland, the suppression of human rights in their own country, the shooting down of a Korean airliner, the recent shooting of an American military officer, Major Arthur Nicholson in Germany, have worsened our views of Soviet policies and intentions. Yet fortunately for the world, the intense feelings between our two countries has not led to a direct military conflict. One of the reasons is that our two governments have maintained full diplomatic relations, consulted regularly, and concluded several important arms control treaties. I have returned from my trip to Russia convinced that, at the very least, we need to maintain these vital lanes of communication. I have come to appreciate something even more. Too often in the past, we have reacted to Soviet behavior with sanctions, such as the grain embargo, that have hurt us almost as much as they've hurt the Soviets. 
We have to be tough with dealing with them, but we haven't played it smart through the years, and we should play it smart. Recent Soviet behavior in Afghanistan, Poland, and internally has created major obstacles on the road to normal relations between our two countries. The road to smoother relations is a long, tough, and difficult one. But this much is clear. The farther we advance down that road, the easier it will be to avoid war and to guard the peace. My visit to the Soviet Union reminded me of the difference between the democratic and communist countries. Here in the United States, we have the opportunity to freely discuss our differences. We have the right to speak openly, to question national policy, and to propose alternatives. Let me say a word about an area of national policy that is the source of major controversy at the present time. I refer, of course, to the administration's policy with regard to Central America. In Congress, as you know, we have voted to give massive amounts of military and economic aid to the government of El Salvador. The purpose of this aid is to help that country build a united, democratic nation that is secure against aggression. It is one thing to help a country like El Salvador that we support. It is another to aid in the overthrow of a government like Nicaragua that we do not support. Too many times in this century, the United States has tried to solve Latin American problems with the use of force, so-called gunboat diplomacy. It has gotten us nowhere. It has only earned us enemies in the Central America region. Instead of acting to overthrow governments, we should be working with Latin nations attempting to build peace in that region. Our best bet in Central America is not gunboat diplomacy, but smart diplomacy. We need to ally ourselves with the process that began at the Contradora and base our policy on a firm foundation of regional cooperation. The Contradora, of course, are the nations of Venezuela, Colombia, uh, Colombia, Paramount, uh, Panama, and, and Mexico. I have talked within the last month to the various leaders of nations. About eight days ago, I was in Spain. I met Gonzalves there, the prime minister of Spain. Spain is a socialist monarchy. They have a parliament just like the nations of the world, like Canada or, or like, uh, like England. While they call themselves a socialist government, actually they're a democracy. He's one of the young leaders of the world. In his conversation with us, the policy of the United States government is wrong. The United States, instead of going and funding militarily the Contras, should be working for a compromise. And they should be working through the Contraduras. The president of Argentina recently addressed the Congress of the United States in my private conversation with him. The Contradoras, you should beef them up. You shouldn't be thwarting their will. You should give them the money to be able to organize with their expertise, their culture, their language, their knowledge of the area. They can solve this problem for you. Argentina, Brazil, and Peru, and I'm sure Spain, would stand there as overseers to see if they can help in the prospect. I've talked to Moy the president of Kenya, who was in not too long ago, the Taoiseach of Ireland. Whatever leaders of the nation that I talk to, they all tell us that the policy of the United States government is wrong. And I believe that we should go the Contra Dora route. It doesn't fa if it fails, then it's time to look at some other matter. But first, we should try that. I came here today to discuss a broader philosophical debate on our country's future. It deals with the role of the government in American life, what we can and should do together to improve the chances of every American for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I want to begin by doing what President Reagan does so often, quoting Franklin Roosevelt. 
The year was 1942, in the dark early days of World War II. The Nazis controlled all of Europe. In Asia, the Japanese Empire was at its zenith. Our country, having entered the war, faced a terrible challenge of mobilizing a peacetime economy into a war machine capable of stopping and beating the worst menace in the men in mankind and history. We were still staggering from the Great Depression. Franklin Roosevelt never doubted that the United States of American people, what we could accomplish. The most significant fact in recent American history, he said, is the ability of the American people to face a tough situation, to take orderly and united action in their own behalf, and in behalf of the things in which they believe. Those were not merely the steering words of a great leader. I testify as an eyewitness to our, what our America, American democracy has accomplished. I know for 50 years I've been there. I witnessed myself in a half, year, half century of public life. I have seen for myself in my own lifetime what America can achieve. There are those who come to the young and the people of today and they preach to you doom and gloom. They tell everything that is wrong with the political system and with our government. They tell you how great things were way back when and how bad things are today. Please don't believe that message. People who talk about the good old days have either forgotten about the past or never lived through it in the first place. Let me, let me take a moment to describe a country to you. This country is a desperate place. Half of the people live in poverty. 25% of the workforce is unemployed. Life is a little better for those who are working. The policeman works 12 hours a day, 84 hours a week. The fireman is on duty even longer. He works 108 hours a week. The postman delivers the, de the mail six days a week and on holidays and even on Christmas Day. For most, the work week is six days long. The only time workers have for themselves and their family is on Sunday. If you're sick, your will collapses. For most people, health insurance is out of the question. Life for the elderly is filled with uncertainty, dependency, and horror. When you get old, you're without income, without hope. On the lucky few, only the lucky few, about 10% of the nation have pensions. Social security does not exist, and but 3% have health insurance. In the country I describe, there is only the very rich in the top and millions of poor in the bottom, with a huge and terrible distance between. There is a handful in the middle class, a small elite, just 3%, go on to college if you're lucky enough to have been to high school. This land that I describe is not some third world nation in Africa. It is the United States of America in the 30s. The America that I knew when I first entered public life. When I look at the problems we face today, I never forget how far we've come in a half century. By the 1970s, we had cut poverty in this country from 50% where it was in the 1930s to 11% in 1979. The Americas of 1980s is no longer a nation with a small upper class and a giant lower class. In America today is a broad middle class. 65% of our young men and women are able to go to college. 99% of our workers have some type of a health insurance. 
Social Security has made it possible for people to retire with a minimal, steady income, not to live in fear and dependency. Without such protection, half of those people now on Social Security would have been living in poverty. This massive improvement in the United States life, it didn't happen by accident. It be happened in FDR words, our people faced up to the tough situation and took united action on behalf of the things that they believed in. It resulted from national policies that stimulated the development in energy, housing, transportation, and every other sector of the economy. Economic growth came about most of all because government at every level was willing to invest in the most vital of all national resources, the individual human mind. We did these things, the Congress of the United States, the presidents along the line, because in a democracy you describe to the will and the wishes of the majority of the people. These achievements in economic and social progress were not the work of just one political party alone. America survived the Dust Bowl in the 30s because of the grace of God and because of the American farmer developed the know-how to take agriculture to the, le to the level of science in this country. Our agriculture is the wonder and the salvation of the world because universities like yours, Kansas State, established more than a century ago through the inspiration of the greatest of all Republican presidents, Abraham Lincoln. It was Franklin Roosevelt who saw the calamity that old age could be and founded Social Security. It was FDR again who sent a group to make a study of those who were overseas fighting. And they came back saying their greatest desire was an education. And the Congress bill signed and passed the GI Bill of Rights that gave so many of your parents and grandparents the chance to go to college that helped create a great American middle class that we have today. Education has been the greatest asset that this nation has. It was President Dwight Eisenhower of Abilene, Kansas, who oversaw construction of our great interstate highway system that has helped to, helped to open the heartland of America economic progress and development. It was the same Republican president who signed the National Defense Education Act, which offered so many deserving young Americans the opportunity to go to college, and which established education as a vital element in our nation's strength and security. The social progress of the past 50 years has improved working conditions provided health protection through Medicare and provided secure retirements through Social Security. At the same time, our society has accepted a strong role in caring for those who cannot take care of themselves, the sick, the handicapped, and the elderly. We have provided a safety net for those who need protection, who cannot, for whatever reason, fend for themselves. Such achievements are rarely recognized today. Whenever I meet a group of success bus successful business people, someone in the group always stands up and says, we'd be much better off without government. For such persons, I have a very simple question. Who paid for your college education? Was it a state government that helped pay for a state university? Was it a community college or a city university? Was it the GI Bill of Rights that financed your education, or was it a government-sponsored loan? Then I have another question for them. If they, the success stories of this country, needed a helping hand up the ladder, why should we not try to give the same help to those young people who are trying to get ahead today? If government could offer opportunities for young people back in the 50s and the 60s. Why should we deny that same help to young people in the 80s?
I believe. I believe that it is wrong for someone who has found his way up the economic and social ladder to pull the ladder up behind him, to deny those who are at the bottom a chance to pull themselves up. No society can exist on a public philosophy. I got mine. Forget the others. We Americans, we Americans believe in fair play. As citizens of this country, we accept the duties as well as the privileges of a de democratic society. Just as the parents must take care of their children when the children are young, so must the children ensure the livelihood of the parents when the parents are aged and old. That is the basis of modern society and of civilization itself. Too often we hear politicians and journalists demean the role of the government enterprise and tell us what we cannot accomplish. But those who argue that the government cannot perform valuable services, they go against the history and the grain of this great nation of ours. America has worked. America has progressed because we have combined our enterprise, both public and private, for the good of all. That is how we pulled our nation out of the Great Depression, won the Second World War, released the power of the atom, put an American to the moon. And that is how we built the fairest, the freest, and the most progressive society in the history of the world. Much of our progress has been based not on the work of one party acting alone, but through the building of a consensus between the two great political powers. In the days of World War II, Harry Truman launched the Marshall Plan, which saved Europe and laid the foundation for the Western Alliance. Could not have done it without the aid of such Republicans as Senator Arthur Vandenberg of Michigan and Congressman Christian Herter of Massachusetts. In 1950, President Eisenhower did not dismantle the New Deal. He accepted such advances as Social Security. President Lyndon Johnson could never have signed the civil rights legislation in the 60s without the bipartisan support of a great Republican leader, Everett Dirksen of Illinois. Many times in our history, one party has managed to learn from the other party. For years, the Democrats argued that we should end isolation in China and open up our ties to the People's Republic. It took a Republican president. Finally, he took this historic step. The nation and the Democrats applauded him. For years, we Democrats have argued for a tax reform that the system is wrong, for the need to make the system fairer. President Reagan says he was going to present such a measure. Believe me, we Democrats will be there to help. For years, Republicans have argued against the evils of big deficits. They convinced many Americans, including many Democrats, of the need of a greater fiscal responsibility. Unfortunately for the country, some Republicans seem to have forgotten their own lesson along the way for the deficits keep growing. Today we face serious challenges. Despite the economic recovery of the past two years, there are serious pockets of economic despair. The poverty rate, which I spoke of, which declined so dramatically by the 1970s, it has risen since 1979 from 11 points to 15 percentage points of our population. It is particularly high among younger Americans. A disturbing 25% of our children of preschool age are living below the poverty line. Across much of America's industrial belt, there's a rust bowl to rival the dust bowl of the 1930s. We need to rebuild American industry and to establish fair trade laws that give our industry a fair chance to compete in the world markets. 
Hundreds of thousands of American farm families face a terrible dilemma. They're caught in the tightening vice of high interest rates that drive up the cost of doing business and the high price dollar that cuts their market both here and abroad. While the administration remains opposed to our legislation to extend farm credits, I am hopeful that it will take some steps to cut interest rates and restore a reasonable price for the dollar. Most of our problems relate to the budget. Our national debt has doubled since 1981. It will triple again by the end of this administration unless we take tough steps that are needed. If President Reagan accepts the tough reductions on Pentagon waste, we will be ready and prepared to find the savings on the domestic side. Just as we reached an agreement on the revenue policy of 1982 and the Social Security reform of 1983, we can achieve an agreement on budget and tax reform in 1985, and I predict that we will. I cite these challenges not because they are insurmountable, but because they can and will be overcome. I began my public life in 1936 on a slogan of work and wages. I remain convinced that our greatest goal is to give the average family the opportunity to earn an income, to own a home, to educate their children, to take care of the family in, in questions of health, that you may have time for recreation with them and to have security in your later years. That is still the American dream, and it's worth fighting for. Today, there are those who argue that the way to achieve this dream is to do it alone. Go it alone. Forget about the less fortunate. This new morality says that the young should forget about the old. The healthy should ignore the sick, and the wealthy forget the poor. In America, that's an alien philosophy. Our country has never stood for that. We Americans believe in hard work and getting ahead, but we also believe in looking out for the other fellow. That has been the tradition of America from the early days when settlers got together for bond raises. It continues the days as Americans. We see on television the youngest school child dipping into his pocket and shipping in to help him the starving of Africa. How pleased we are. Why? That's an American way of life. Thanks to the know-how of the American farmer and the generosity of our country itself, you here in the breadbasket of America are pursuing the work not only of men but of gods. I have just come from a country, the Soviet Union, that recognizes neither the existence of God or the rights of man. I have returned to a nation that has insisted from its earliest beginnings that the individual human being is of fundamental value, that the humblest, meekest person has the right to be treated with dignity and respect. Our whole history has been a 200-year struggle to strengthen and enlarge the benefits of democratic freedom, to include women and minorities and young people into our electoral process, to protect, protect the individual rights, rights and the welfare of all of our citizens, to build social and economic opportunity for everyone. Looking back at a half century in public life, I've seen the greatness of this struggle, and I've seen the truth and the optimism of my friend Jack Kennedy. Our problems are man-made, Therefore, they can be solved by man. Man's reason and spirit have often solved the seemingly unsolvable, and we believe that they can do it again. Our American, with American ingenuity and American generosity, this, our nation, under God, will not only survive our current challenges, it will prevail, it will flourish. 
These are the views of a man who in the twilight of his career, as he steps out of public life and pulls down the shade, truly looks at America. Thank you. You tuned to KSDB FM, Manhattan, Kansas. Thank you. Thank you. Well, next time we get to the ten minutes for questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We have about 10 minutes for questions. I recognize that the 1130 classes will soon begin and a few students will need to leave the audience and a few faculty. We, uh, we have microphones to your left and to your right on the ground floor. For the audience in the balcony, it's almost impossible for us to spot and acknowledge persons there, so we do not have microphones in the balcony. We invite those in the balcony who would like to uh, pose a question to come down to the left or the right and utilize the microphone. Our first question, I believe, will to the, be the microphone on your right. Uh, first question. Mr. O'Neill, I'm uh, wondering about one remark that you made with regard to the situation in Nicaragua, where I'm very happy to see that you support the Contadora process. But you said that if the Contadora process does not work, then we should look at other matters. What particular other matter did you have in mind? What other alternative would you suggest? I appreciate the fact that it's a Marxist government down there. I do also appreciate the fact. Uh, and I get this report from uh, the nuns that are down there, the clergy that are down there, the concerned people who have been working uh, down there to help. Uh, let me say, uh, what is the reason that the president and the administration is going the way that they are? Uh, they figure that uh, possibly along the line, as a matter of fact, not possibly, they are concerned about the fact uh, that that whole bed, the area of El Salvador, of, of Costa Rica, or Honduras, could eventually go communist, and that's what uh, the, uh, the Sandinistas are attempting to do. Uh, would they bring arms over and into the other areas? Uh, would they set up missile sites uh, that would be aimed and be destructive to the United States? When I say other things that you can do, I would have to say that I, uh, as much as I am a peace-loving person and want no help to go to the Contras, we could not stand and would not stand in the event that that Marxist government down there, we haven't been able to interdict anything or find anything that they have, uh, that they have transported over. Uh, some people say it's a myth, some they deny that they are doing it. If they're not doing it, that's fine. If they're doing it, if we find that they're doing it, if they have secret equipment and weapons which are aimed at the United States government, then the United States government on both sides, the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, could never stand for a thing like that. And we would have to overview and look at what we would do. Would it mean force at that particular time? I don't know. If it took force to do it, and uh, I would say we would be unanimous in, in, in doing something of that nature. We hope that that wouldn't really happen along the line. We firmly believe in the policy that we are setting out of money to go to the uh, International Red Cross or go to the OAS or go to the United Nations uh, to be able to be used for humanitarian purposes. The remainder of the money to be given to the Contra Nations and all they may form a firm uh, cabinet or membership or organization so that they can put uh, both the, uh, uh, the uh, Sandinistas and, and the, the Contras together in peace talks. Question on the left. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Strategic Defense Initiative, or otherwise known as SDI, or as Senator Edward Kennedy put it, Star Wars, is the effort to develop a system that would knock out incoming ICBMs by using particle beams, electronic lasers, and chemical lasers. We can all be pretty sure that the Soviet Union is developing SDI, whether we build it or not. This would give them a very dangerous lead in the arms race. 
Why don't we develop SDI? Well, of course, we're at the salt talks now, and that is the big argument that's going on. Uh, Gorbachev, he said that uh, I have my Russians sitting over there, my Soviets sitting over there, spending, drinking tea and spending millions of dollars of rubles. You have your American people uh, just sitting around there drinking tea and spending American monies. The, uh, and, and I talked with Gorbachev, he said, you people tell us it's a defensive weapon. It is merely a defensive weapon. Well, who do you think we are, Tanzania? Who do you think we are, Uganda? Do you think that we're that naive to believe that the SDI, the Star Wars, is merely a defensive weapon? Of course it's not a defensive weapon. Now, I'm quoting Gorbachev. He said, I want to tell you, he said, it'll take us 1 20th to put together an armament that'll knock that out of the sky uh, before you would even have it completed. It's a sore spot at the present time. In my opinion, the president has asked for about $4 billion for research. I think the Congress will give him about $2 billion, and I think we will go forward. It's something that won't be built until after the year 200, because uh, it's in its infancy. They are looking at this particular times as, as to whether it can work. As you know, in November of this year, I think 26 of the big companies in America got together and sat down as to whether or not it was feasible. We're even, we're studying now the feasibility of, uh, of, it, of, it, of going forward with the advancement of the technology before we get to even building it. So the truth of the matter is, America is going to try it. It is a bargaining chip at the present time at the, at the board. Uh, the biggest trouble with the, with the uh, present start talks that are taking place is that uh, our administration says it is not on the board. It is not up for discussion. I believe that that is one of the things, ultimately, when the President and Gorbachev get together, that they will talk about, is it on the table or isn't it on the table? The feasibility of an SDI, uh, it, it's almost incomprehensible to believe that we could do such a thing, that we can accomplish such a thing, a shelter over an, a nation's so you could prevent a nuclear bomb from coming in. Will we proceed? I think we will proceed. We will give to our people an advantage. We will give to our people that are at the Geneva talks uh, a, a chip that they probably need at this particular time. So that's how I see the history of it right at this particular time. Thank you. Question on the right. You said, sir, that one of the primary goals of the American Democratic Society is to protect the natural rights of man. Would you then be in favor of a policy of divestiture of American economic interests in the country and government of the country of South Africa, where such rights are so frighteningly violated? Well, I, for one, don't believe in the policy of the President of the United States. And I've asked so many times, no matter where I am, why are so many people being arrested or, uh, down in front of uh, the South African embassy? The reason they're being arrested and the reason that they're going on with this continuously is too few people of America appreciate uh, about up, uh, up, uh, up. Yeah. <laughs> too, too few people actually understand what is going on in South Africa. That's an educational, the apathy, that's a an educational process that is going on in Washington at the present time. I disagree with our, uh, with our policy, and uh, uh, I think that we said take stringent means, and the stringent means are uh, cutting off the money supplies. I realize very well that they have some great uh, strategic material that we need, uh, but it just can't go the route of uh, one-fifth of a nation because it's white having the supremacy over the rest of the world. And it's, again, uh, America being the most powerful nation in the world, it should be trying to do something at the table of uh, trying to bring these groups together rather than acting the way, the way we're acting. So I am in disagreement with the president's policy. Mr. Speaker, you spoke of what you had learned from many priests and nuns and Protestant missionaries and other church workers in Nicaragua, the one thing you mentioned was that they had led you to believe that that was a Marxist, a Marxist government there. But did they, uh, did they also tell you what 
the people there think about the government that they elected? Did they tell you what the what that government is doing for the people in the area of education and health, the very things that yes. you said made us great? Yes. Did they tell you what our terrorists are doing to those efforts when they blow up schools, hospitals, snipe teachers, kill doctors? And what did they think about the prospect of the president's giving humanitarian aid to people who pull people out in the middle of the night and castrate a man in front of his family, strip skin off his face and put a grenade in his head and blow his head off in front of his family? Well, uh, let, let me say that I have to agree with all the statements that you've made. Uh, we had a, a Sister McDonough, very, very interesting woman, handsome-looking woman who was an assistant United States attorney in Massachusetts. At the age of 35, she decided that uh, uh, she had a vocation and a call to God and that she wasn't doing enough with her life, and she became a nun, and she's down there. Not too long ago, she was in to visit me. Uh, it was about the time of the elections. She said, these poor people, she said, they don't know what a Marxist is. They don't know what communism is. They don't know what Lenin is. They don't even know what Reagan is, to be perfect. Well, who Reagan is? All they know is that they're leading a better life, that they have schools for the first time, that they have clinics for the first time, that they have doctors for the first time, that they're learning to read and write, and the literacy is leaving, and they're inoculated against disease, and the marketplace is better for them as far as food and things of that nature. And if there was a fair election that they thought that whoever ran, uh, whether it was a Sandinista or, uh, or somebody else, uh, some opponent, that they would vote for the Sandinistas because their life had been better. And they did talk about the fact that I had a nun in about 10 days ago who was one of those that were kidnapped, uh, kidna kidnapped by the Contras, held for about uh, 36 hours. Uh, she told me about the wedding that took place and them coming into the church and and blowing up uh, and, and killing all in the wedding party. Those things are hard to conceive. Uh, there's no question that there's cruelty and brutality, I believe, on both sides, on both sides. No, I wouldn't say it was equal as I average it out right now, uh, because I think the Contras uh, uh, have been brutally savage. And as a matter of fact, I don't... Uh, I resented when uh, the president said to me, you come from that section of the world where it all began, Boston, uh, John Adams and San Adams and Paul Revere and Hancock, and he compares these butchers as the freedom fighters to them. It rankles me, to be perfectly truthful, and I get tremendously upset about it. Uh, the, truth of the truth of the matter is, you can't condone the action of either side. The best thing to happen is to get them together. Can they be gotten together? Yes, I believe in all the leaders that I've talked to from that area that they can be gotten together. Now, you asked me about whether I, th I thought uh, humanitarian rights and supplies uh, should go to the Contras, not should go to the Contras in, in the purpose of uh, feeding a man and so you won't have to pay for his rations and he would be able to buy ammunition. The answer is no. Humanitarianly, I believe that anybody that is suffering, anybody that is suffering down in that area we should give them sufficient help. But this should be guided by either the United Nations or the OAS or the International Red Cross, and they are to be making the decision as to the need of the individual, whether an individual is a Sandinista or whether they're a Contra. If they're lying out there bleeding and wounded and dying and, and, need, uh, and, and need sustenance, they, they should be aided. Humanitarian says that. You don't make a distinction. But going in and helping, I don't agree with the president that uh, we should have humanitarian uh, help for the purpose of, of helping the contrast and, and helping the contrast so you, they can divert, as I said, the money that they would normally spend on food and rationing and things of that nature on medicine, and they can use it in the supply of guns. One of the things that bothers me terrifically down there <laughs> is when we cut off the supplies, we cut off the supplies. There were only 9,000 contraduras. At the present time, now there are 15,000. So where does the money come from? I have to presume we've been checking with the CIA and things of that nature. They're monitoring very well. It, it, it's coming from the Samo, uh, Samosas people who, who live in Miami. They have built that army up to 15,000. But the thing that I'm more frightened about than anything is this 12,000, the purposes of this $12 million, and the 20, or the $14 million, rather, the president wants, and the $28 million that he wants in the, in the uh, budget of 86 is to build those contracts to 35, 
thousand troops to make a true war going on down there. And if it doesn't succeed, what I'm fighting about is our troops being in on there. And that's what I'm fighting absolutely against at all times. <laughs> Because of the speaker's schedule, we must uh, terminate the questions. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we appreciate so very much your climaxing our Land and Lecture series this year. Fantastic. We are adjourned. Question and answer period with Massachusetts Representative Thomas Tip O'Neill, Jr., Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. Speaker O'Neill delivered the 69th Land and Lecture in the series of Land and Lectures on Public Issues at Kansas State University in McCain Auditorium. Our engineers, Del Staub and John Howard.